Okay, so now we're officially on. Um, okay, so teaching from my tablet, uh, like I was saying, I'm uh, from Purchase College, director of the Teaching Learning Technology Center there. I regularly get into the classroom, uh, which gives me, you know, the ability to talk with faculty better about uh, opportunities for pedagogy and technology to change how they approach teaching. Uh, and so what I want to talk about really comes out of uh, a specific experience uh, that happened last spring that uh, really started uh, me on a different kind of path. <laughs> I, so I will talk about uh, you know, how and why I've gone to lecturing with an iPad, although lecturing might be uh, a bit of a misnomer as well. Um, I'll talk about the particular app I use, but I'll show you some other whiteboard apps. Uh, I started off with this really as a way to think, well, how can I use my tablet that I have in the classroom to be a little bit more engaging in the conversations I have with my students? But I very, very rapidly figured out that, oh, this would also allow me to record the lectures, the presentations, the discussions we're having in the classroom. Well, what are the opportunities that, that come out of that? Uh, I make use of a variety of different cloud services as, as I'm working on this, um, and I'm a little bit anal compulsive, so uh, I'll sketch out a whole variety of cloud services, but you know, you can, if you want to do this kind of approach, you can approach it in a, in a much simpler format. What, where I'm heading for this semester that's coming up is to have this all feed into uh, you know the buzzer word flip classroom so that I can spend less time talking at my students in class and have more time um, to have the students working on applications uh, that are more engaging. Okay, so how and why um, is. Mm, Necessity is the mother of invention, right? So I have normally, our, our standard kind of uh, classroom setup is the standard kind of enhanced pr presenter mode, the ability to bring up slides and talk through them. Uh, most of our classrooms are equipped with Symposium tablets and smart tools. And so in the past, I had the, kind of the approach of, well, when we're doing lecture in class, which is not all the time, you know, I would... Um, go through the presentations, I would use the pen tools to write on um, the slides to highlight different things and at, at the end of the day uh, I could export those annotated slides as a PDF and I could put the PDF up in Moodle and then students would have not only my, my PowerPoint slides, although I don't use PowerPoint but they'd also have some notes about what we talked about around those slides. And so that was kind of the rhythm I would be in for you know, several years. Um, last spring I was in a tech classroom and for one reason or another, um, no smart tools, no pen, no, no ability to mark up the, ta the slides and save the annotated slides as a PDF to put into Moodle later. So I figured, well, I could submit a work order to say, to get, you know, smart tools in, installed and I could go do what I normally do, but I figu figured, well, I have a tablet and I should be able to figure out some way where I could present from my tablet in a way that's even, you know, more engaging. So uh, that's, that's the whole genesis of all of this. You know, a little simple thing like that, I can't do this way I used to do it. Uh, but I've got some new opportunities here. Let's let's see what I could do. Now I would like to say, um, I would like to say that I then went through an exhaustive evaluation of all of the whiteboard apps that are available and ta ta tallied up their pros and cons and and you know this is good for this and this is good. For, no, I I found one. Uh, which is not up on the screen at this point. Uh, it's the one I will spend most of the time talking about. Uh, it's called Explain Everything. It cost me a whole $1.99 at that time because they were running a special. Normally it's $2.99. Um, and so I sprung for this app. I got a stylus. I had to actually um, 
by a dock to VGA connector because we had no way in the classrooms to present wirelessly from the tablets. So that spent, sent me back another you know, $20, $25. So, okay, I'm all set. I've got a whiteboard. I have to figure out how to bring my slides in and, and use it. I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about some of the whiteboard apps you <coughs> have available. How many of you actually have your own tablets? Okay. Um, how, it, how many of you have opportunity to get loaner tablets from the college? Maybe not. Um, the library has one tablet now. Okay. We have an iPad that is available. Yeah. Okay. So this use of tablets as a whiteboard is very popular, especially in K through 12. I'm finding. Okay. A lot of fact. A lot of teachers and students. Uh, teachers especially, but also students in one-to-one -one programs, are, they're you know, getting flooded with tablets in K-12. through And so um, there are a lot of whiteboard apps that uh, you could consider if you wanted to do this kind of thing. I just want to run through quickly what some of them are and give you some, some highlights of them. If you look at, you know, top five application, uh, top five apps for teaching with an iPad, uh, from site after site after site. Uh, Edge of Creations is one that continually shows up. Um, www.edgeofcreations.com. It is not only a, a whiteboard app for your tablet, and I believe it is uh, iPad only. And some of these are Android or iPad. Many of them are only iPad, I guess because there's so many iPads flooding the schools. But it's also an online community. And so you sign up for an account at Edge of Creations. When you do your lessons on the Edge of Creations whiteboard app, you have the ability to upload your, app, your lesson, a video of that lesson, to your account at Edge of Creations. You can keep it private so that you can only use it and share it with your students. You can make it public. And so there is a lot of, there is a lot of activity of teachers, K through 12 teachers and college instructors doing uh, lectures, lessons, whatever terminology you want to use, and sharing them um, on the Edge Creation site. And they're kind of categorized. So you can see, you know, math, science, language, arts, social sciences. You can see the influences of, of K through 12 in here. But when you uh, create your lesson and upload it, you can specify, well, I'll show you in a minute what you can specify. All of these whiteboard tools have a very similar kind of tool set. Um, clearly, if you're going to use this as a whiteboard, you need the ability to, um, to be able to draw on the slides. Um, in the case of... Uh, Edge of Creations here, you've got a very simple um, pen uh, and eraser palette. You can select different colors. You have the ability to add uh, text or images or, you know, you can take a picture with your iPad and embed that in your lesson. Um, these options here are only available if you actually pay for the pro version of Edge of Creations. But you can, um, <clears throat> I mean, in terms of creating a lesson, you basically would um, put together multiple pages, however many pages of content you want to go through. You would hit the record button, which is kind of hidden by, by the explain everything um, toolbar over there. But you would hit record, talk through the slides, draw on the slides. Uh, there's a lot of algebra kinds of lessons where obviously you're going to want to be able to write out formulas and solve equations and so forth. And um, it's a very natural, I find, kind of way to talk about um, a set of content. Keith, can I ask sure. you about that? Can you import like a document and then draw on top of it? Or do you have to create it? The, the pro version would let you okay. import a document. Okay. Okay, um, and I'll, I'll go into more detail when we get to explain everything uh, because that's really the one that I've been focusing on. 
But here is uh, a screen showing what it looks like when you have completed your recording of your lesson. And you want to save it not as a draft, but actually as a final published product. It basically converts your lesson into a movie. And uh, you, know, you can put in a title, a description, you can make it private or publish it to the community. You can select those different um, subject matter areas. You can also specify the grade level. Is this, a, you know, is this a fourth grade lesson? Is it a higher education lesson? So forth. It makes it obviously easier for other members of the education community to look for um, you know, appropriate subject matter and level lessons that they might want to share with their students. So, you know, to some extent, I, I kind of like the online community aspect. I've never gotten plugged into it because uh, the Explain Everything app that I use, which I like very much, really doesn't have that, uh, that aspect to it. And then this is just, you can see, you can have drafts that you're working on. You can have finished ones that are published up to the site. But it's fairly limited. I mean, you don't have the ability to, as far as I know, take these videos out to your YouTube account. Um, that would make it more easy for you to bring into Moodle, which is basically what one of the features I like so much about Explain Everything. Okay, okay this is just another one, showme.com. Um, again, this is a combination of the whiteboard app with an online community. You create an account, you can create a, a group, uh, as you could with edu uh, creations as well. So you can set up class space in your online account, invite your students, and have the ability to share you know, privately your lessons with just your class online. Uh, again, very similar uh, set of tools. Um, you can choose, well, choose photo, take photo, uh, search for images on the web. You see that search for images on the web has kind of a dotted check mark because when I was playing around last night, I found out if you do uh, start in the free version doing searches for images on the web, they let you do it 48 times <laughs> before you have to upgrade to the pro version. Um, but uh, this one also, <laughs> this one also uh, uh, integrates with your Dropbox and Google Drive accounts, uh, which uh, explain everything does as well. And I'll, I'll go into that in more detail when we get to that. Uh, but again, you know, different uh, different pens uh, with uh, kind of a limited range of color palettes, the ability to uh, add text the ability to uh, add these different kinds of image, uh, you know, eraser and so forth. And then what's critically important in all of these, which is something, a feature I didn't really look at when I was first stumbling around here, is, you know, the, the fact that they have a record button. And the fact that I'm recording this presentation right now, and I'll put it up in my YouTube account uh, when I get back and share it back with the, uh, with the event organizers. One thing uh, I find with Show Me is that, uh, so again, you can see you have the ability to set up multiple pages uh, in your Show Me presentation. You would start the record button, you would talk about the first page, and then you would go on to the second page and talk about it. Um, when you have objects on the page, whether it's uh, a bit of text or this image, it doesn't have quite the same natural way of manipulating those objects. You have to kind of press down on one of the objects to switch into a kind of a different um, object manipulation mode where you can then do the kind of natural um, pinch and expand and drag and drop and so forth uh, approach to moving these around. So that, I, I found, was a, a little bit of, a, of an annoying feature. Uh, once you're done positioning things, you can click Done, and you can go back to the screen where you can actually annotate the slides and talk about it. With Show Me, I think 
you would have to create uh, in the program, which is not the way I use explain everything. Um, we'll get to my workflow in a little bit, but what I do is basically use Google Docs presentations, and then I save those as a PDF, and then I bring those PDFs in to explain everything as objects, and it automatically parcels it out into different pages. You know, the pages here are primarily static slides that I am talking over and annotating. There are at times when it's actually better to have your slides set up as objects that um, you can manipulate on the screen, and I'll, I'll go through an example of that. Just a, a few more, they, it begins to get kind of, haven't I heard that before, uh, after a while. Screen Chomp is another one of these whiteboard apps. It in particular is very focused on, I think, the K through six market. It's very cutesy. Um, you know, the tools, it, I think it's got stamp tools, so you can, you know, do uh, the kinds of things you would expect to do. Not the kinds of things I want to do with my freshman at, at purchase, so. But it could be fun, I guess. And these are all free, or at least they have free versions that you can then upgrade to the Pro. SyncSpace is an interesting take because it is a collaborative whiteboard space. So I could open up a uh, sync space document on my iPad and I could share it with some other sync space user that's got the sync space app on their iPad and they could be over in London for all I care and we could draw on the whiteboard together. So I think that's a seriously cool feature. Nothing that I have use for in my class but you know it's worth knowing about um, if you want to have a, a whiteboard space or working with a collaborator at a, you know, at a remote site. <coughs> Doceri gets a lot of press. Um, there is a free version of it. There's also a pro version, which is like $4.99. Uh, so it's you know, on the high end of the app market. There's also a desktop ver client, which you can pick up for like 30 bucks. The, the big... Um, the, the thing that separates Doceri from some of these other whiteboard apps is that you can very often use it as a, uh, a control for your computer. So I could have my MacBook uh, over there plugged into the projector, and you know if we didn't have the Apple TV set up for me to project to the projector here, I could use I could open up the Doceri document on my iPad and it would open up on the, my MacBook, which is hooked up to the projector, and I can do all the things, you know, you know annotate, do whatever I want to do here. Those annotations would be mirrored on the client, the desktop client on the MacBook, which is hooked up to the projector, so the students can see. Okay. So um, I think um, there are some of the other SUNY campuses, at least one or two, that have used Doceri, in that kind of mode, rather than trying to figure out wireless projection from the iPad directly to the projector, we'll put a Doceri client on the computer in the, in the instructor podium, we'll put uh, Doceri on the iPad. I think uh, Doceri is also available for Android devices, but I, you know, that's off the top of my head, so I'm not sure. On and on, there's Jot. Um, yeah, I don't know if I've got anything new to say that hasn't been said on about the other whiteboard apps. Um, if you did a search for whiteboard apps in the Google Play Store or the <coughs> iTunes Store, you would find dozens of other ones. But these are the ones that are most often float to the top of the you know the lists of of whiteboard apps. Uh, like as I've alluded to a, a few times, I found explain everything right off the bat. Paid for it, loved it, and I really haven't gone back uh, since. So, uh, you know, it does uh, all of the things that um, you would expect out of these whiteboard apps. Uh, in fact, you've been watching me use it for the last uh, 20 minutes. Um, you know, typical kinds of tools, there is the... Yeah. Um, 
hand tool for moving things around. You can select a variety of different pencils, different thicknesses, different colors. Uh, text tool, obviously. Um, this tool here for adding uh, objects to the um, page is how I import my PDF files of my slides. Uh, you know, eraser. Uh, there's a laser tool which I've used uh, to good uh, effect in class. Um, and again, the ability to record what's going on. Uh, explain everything. We'll lay down uh, two recording tracks. One is the audio that's coming off of the iPad. And um, clearly, it, you know, it does an excellent job picking up uh, uh, the instructor, but we can have, I can actually have discussions with my class, and if they're sitting in the first half of the, of the classroom, they show up fairly well in the audio track on uh, Explain Everything. The other track is for all of the uh, events that are going on. You know, I, when I'm drawing or annotating something or using the laser pointer, that other track records all of those actions, and those actions then become incorporated into the explain everything project file and as I export it as a an mp4 movie that I upload to Google you know it's all of uh, all of that uh, action is going on as well so because I could not in the classroom last spring use the smart tools to provide just static annotations of my slides as PDFs that I dumped into Moodle I now have the situation where the students are getting not only the slides and the annotations and all of our commentary and discussion back and forth uh, as a YouTube video that I can then put into Moodle. Uh, I, I actually have a much richer capture of what's going on in the classroom than I had before. So the problem of not having the smart tools actually became a much better solution. Uh, that doesn't mean I was happy at the time, but... <laughs> Writing on there, are you saying that when you close this, your notes that you've written on there are going to stay there? Yeah. Until you want to. Right. Eliminate. So. Um, and can your students read your handwriting? <laughs> well, that's the question. But I mean, this this shows the kind of discussion. I mean, this we're talking about the carbonate silicate cycle and how it acts as a planetary thermostat where if planetary temperatures go up, that leads to increased weathering. The increased precipitation weathering draws more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, which tends to decrease the temperature. And so, you know, we've got that kind of negative feedback loop um, that's, you know, a key critical component for, you know, understanding climate. And so, um, yeah, my, my, my handwriting isn't the best. But they're also hearing me talk about it at the same time. They're hearing the questions that they ask and my answers, or they're hearing the questions that I ask and their answers. Right. And uh, you know, they can I can kind of reinforce the idea that this is a cycle. This is a negative re uh, negative feedback loop, and negative feedback loops tend to stabilize systems. And so, planetary thermostat. I was more curious if you had to rewrite it every time you it. Uh, I would. What I would do if I were giving this lecture again, which I will be doing this semester, mm -hmm. maybe not in class, maybe outside of class, as a flipped classroom lecture, is I would take that uh, PDF file, which I still have, which is pristine, of all the slides. Maybe I, I would actually probably go back to my Google Docs presentation and up, update that and do a new uh, export to PDF and bring that into a new project file so that I would have a pristine slate for the conversation with this semester's. So you can write on it again. Write on it again, yeah. And, um, yeah, so. And so explain everything, stores everything as explain everything project files. Um, you could actually, there is actually a desktop player that will play the project files, but I can export that to an MP4 video I can put up my YouTube account, so why would I bother having my students download this free explain everything player when I just put it up on YouTube. Uh, kind of jumping the gun a little bit, but 
when I put the, the uh, when, when I have explained everything, export to YouTube, I can have it as a public file or as an uh, unlisted file. And so the unlisted file gives me the option of putting the link in Moodle, embedding the file in Moodle, and having my students easily be able to view it without it being public. I actually don't care. Whoever wants to use my lectures can use my lectures, so I just go ahead and put them up public on my YouTube channel. Quick question. Yeah. Um, so you're doing the markup with the styles right now, but can you choose the, the A and add, add, add text to it as well while you're doing the presentation? Yeah. And then it becomes an object that you can move wherever you want. And then you click the check to close the location. Yeah. So uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, you can see uh, I've suddenly become much more prolific at putting videos up on my YouTube channel. Um, and I, I could actually um, go out of Explain Everything and take you to the YouTube channel. One of the objects you can actually put into your Explain Everything presentation is on the fly. I can, I can dynamically put in a new web browser. And so this browsing, any annotation of websites that I want to do, gets captured right into the Explain Everything project file. So if I, and it'll bring up the mobile version of a browser. So uh, if I do Mars Global Surveyor, MOA, I'm getting some, some interesting Apple TV uh, effects here. So you can't just put, like if you have a link in your uh, slides, you can't just click on it? A link in the slides would take you to the browser on the tablet, which Explain Everything would not capture. Okay. Uh, but the ability to have this um, browser within your presentation allows you to actually capture the browsing you're doing. Now there is one limitation. Um, uh, this is the mobile log map, which is essentially plotting all the elevation. Actually, the, the, the How did that, uh, biggest thing I've had to get used to yeah. is so hearing myself. <laughs> so this was a capture during class where I'm talking about... using the laser pointer tool to simulate a laser altimeter. So you can hear some of the, the comments from the students. <laughs> okay, that's enough of that. Okay, one limitation though I found with a browser is that if I stop it and I you know, use some other tool uh, and go back to the hand tool, it, it's a dead browser at that point. So I would have to, if I wanted to browse to some other site, I could quickly, you know, click on the plus down here to open up a new blank slide, embed another web browser, type in a new address, and then, then go to it and have a live browser again. I'm not sure what's going on why you can't, within a slide, go back to the browser again, but if you're going to show some kind of website and talk about it and annotate it, you kind of have to know what you want to look at. Um, most of the time, I am talking over slides that I've imported from a presentation. But you know, sometimes it is nicer to 
um, have actual objects on the screen. So I've just added uh, an image of the Mars Global Surveyor and you know again you can use the very natural pinch and expand kind of uh, of tools. So what I did was basically uh, set up some Mars terrain and I had the Global Surveyor. I could use the hand tool to simulate the spacecraft moving in its orbit, switch over to the laser pointer and then you know, use the um, simulator laser pulse, go back to the hand tool, uh, go back to the laser pointer, and all the while I'm doing my little pattern, my little spiel with the students. Uh, so. uh, just quickly, I need to kind of breeze through some of the other features. Um, I think zooming, the ability to zoom uh, images on your slide is something that uh, is a new way of thinking about talking about imagery than you would have, that I would have with either my PowerPoint presentations or... So here's a, here's a map of Mars, and, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to read, but if I actually <coughs> remember to switch over to the hand tool rather than the laser tool, um, you can focus in here. I can then select a uh, um, drawing tool and remind the students that, you know, we talked about Pavonis Mons here since it's a, a high equator, a high volcano right on the equator. This would be the best point to put down the space elevator from orbit, you know. And what's nice is that that annotation stays with the image I put it on. So that's kind of nice. Remember to start the recording again. So you have the ability to put video clips in your project file. And uh, this is a scene from Mission to Mars where they no. encountered this alien planetarium that explains, you know, the disaster that happened to Mars and why the Martians had to go away. I'm still waiting for a good Mars movie to come out. It's Mars. It's Mars! And then, you know, you can stop it, switch over to a pen tool and say, you know, well, obviously we're talking about the site of impact here. So, you know, the ability to actually very naturally annotate over, um, over video clips is, uh, is, I think, useful. Okay, so... Um, you know, these are the different kinds of objects you can embed. I'm primarily bring in the PDFs as a file. Uh, the uh, video clip, the image of Mars, Global Surveyor, those are all just files that I brought into a, uh, a slideshow. Um, you can use the camera on uh, your tablet to actually record... Um, record some video or audio live, like if you are documenting some team-based learning something or other, you want that to be part of the project file. Um, Do you have to save that as a page as well? You no, know, it would become an object in the, in the project file, and then um, it'll be saved into the project file. You can then export it to uh, YouTube video or to a MP4 that you could upload to YouTube or save to your computer or put onto Dropbox or wherever you want to send your MP4 to. And so the actual camera video gets incorporated into that larger video that is a representation of the whole uh, project. And you can see um, well, I'll sh show you in a minute. <coughs> Uh, when you bring in, you can bring in PDFs, PowerPoint, Keynote files, a uh, variety of other uh, um, settings for importing. If you uh, bring in P PDFs or PowerPoints or Keynotes, uh, it will separate the individual slides into individual pages in your presentation. Um, I have 
the idea that I will have been using this as lecture capture. I, I will not put my administrator hat on and go through this slide in a lot of detail. I mean, what I like as a faculty member is it's taking tools I already have in my hand and it's giving me lecture capture functionality that we don't have at Purchase College because we've not invested in a $20,000 lecture capture enterprise system. Uh, you know, $2.99, $8, and uh, a $25 connector, my existing iPad, and I'm set up to capture lectures. So it's very flexible, it's cheap, faculty are self-sufficient. Um, you know, real-time playback of a YouTube video that's 40 minutes long can be a real pain. Uh, lecture capture systems will have tools where students can, you know, go t right to the 18th slide and hear, hear that. So you're, you're missing some of that. YouTube will do some captioning, um, and you can uh, do captioning uh, cleanup of, of that. But most of the enterprise systems will have a more robust captioning system. They'll give you analytics. They, many of them give you kind of a one button tie in to your LMS, whether it's Moodle or Blackboard or whatever. Uh, this is not rocket science, even though I teach Mars exploration. I mean, I have to have my YouTube account. I have to export things to YouTube. Many of our faculty, even the ones who are not very tech savvy, love to put YouTube videos into their Moodle pages because Moodle does all the heavy lifting. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty straightforward tie-in to the LMS. Um, again, you've got the ability to select uh, the movie export, uh, whether you want to do MP4, which is the default, or, or QuickTime movie. I have bit the bullet and actually paid for a... $14.99 app for my Mac, which is the Explain Everything compressor. I could do all the compression converting from Explain Everything project files to MP4 on my, on my tablet and have my tablet export those to YouTube, which I, have, which I did mostly to begin with. But um, I got this so that I could actually just take the project files from my tablet, dump them on my desktop on the Mac, book and have the compressor run through them much more quickly than my tablet will. Um, there was actually a presentation uh, that I did at the SUNY Technology Conference that I just could not get the tablet app to compress it. It got to a particular slide and then stopped and I thought, okay, am I going to spend $15 and have it stop at the same slide, but you know, I, I paid for the desktop app and it just burned right through the compression. Do you know if um, Handbrake is able to convert these files? No, Handbrake is strictly for pulling uh, video and audio object files off of a playable DVD format. So this is a completely different format. It's really Handbrake would have nothing to do with this. I'm pretty sure. Okay, because it can convert things to MP4. Yeah, you know, I haven't looked at Handbrake for a while. I primarily have used it for getting video clips off of DVDs. But, I mean, this is a .p something L file. Yeah, I, I wasn't yeah. sure before that. Yeah, I, I doubt. I was curious if you had tried it. Yeah. I mean, I do have Handbrake on my MacBook. I could clearly see if it could digest uh, and explain everything project file. What's the size on, if you're doing an hour presentation, how much, how much... Storage space do you have to have on your iPad to? Make uh, sure this that is you don't not a big problem. iPad. This is just a basic right. 16 gig. Um, well, let's say you had two lectures in a row. Could you do two lectures in a oh, row? Oh, easily. Okay. Yeah, uh, I do try to clean things up, but there I've got a ton of of explain everything project files here, and you know, for uh, the project files themselves are not going to be that large unless you embed a video into them. Mm -hmm because they are not storing them as real-time video files. They're talking, you know, they're, they're the slide, they're, they're real-time audio, so the audio tracks are there, but those are tiny compared to video tracks. And, you know, it's not saving the drawing, it's saving the commands that made the drawing, which it then crank, cranks through later when to you, output the video. the video. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, here's my YouTube channel. I, I 
I've gotten much more prolific at putting stuff up. I wish my students were more prolific at viewing them, but uh, enough are, are viewing that it's it's uh, it's worthwhile. And I, like I say, I just these are all public, so if you want to go see them, you can do that. Have uh, editing capability on the audio. If there was an audio part that yes. you wanted to uh, take out, yes, there is. It's not a it, you know it if you. I, I think I showed you a screen where you could see the audio track. Mm -hmm. You could select part of the audio track and excise it, or you could clip, um, or, you know, it took me th three, three minutes of ums to get started on this slide, so let me just take off all of that part. It is not, you know, a high, it's not even Audacity, well, not Audacity, Audacity is great. Uh, and free, but you know it's not that level of audio editing. It is basic kind of. Uh, I want to truncate this track, or I want to pull something out. Now, in terms of how I actually use all of this stuff, I'm uh, as I said, I'm a little compulsive, uh, and I like to keep things kind of separated. Um, so I will use my Drive account to create the initial presentations. Uh, you know, uh, as the slide show. Google, PDFs, keynotes, and PDFs go in to explain everything. Google Drive slides, documents, do not. So I will so I will export those presentations as PDFs. And I like to dump them onto my Dropbox account rather than just keeping them on Drive. It's just as a way of kind of separating out the, the different functionality. Uh, so PDFs are here. And then um, I ingest the PDFs into explain everything to give me the basis for my slideshows. If I want to add any objects like that movie file or the image of the Mars Global Surveyor, I'll put those as files on my Dropbox account so I can bring them in. And then do the presentation in class, collect the annotation, um, and then use the export f functionality and explain everything to put the <laughs> MP4s up on my YouTube account, which is then easily embedded in my Moodle account. Okay. So this part over, this half over here is basically lecture capture. And this half over here is basically uh, enhanced present in presentation in class, whatever. I've had my box.net account forever and have never realized why do I have this account? What am I ever going to use it for? Well, aha, I need some place to store the TPL or EPL or whatever, the explain everything project files, you know, the actual project files themselves before they get exported to, to, uh, to uh, video, I actually dump those into a folder on my box account so that I can then, you know, take them, delete them from the app on the iPad just to clean things up every now and then. Um, so that's, you know, that's my basic workflow. Again, it's not a one button within Blackboard or Moodle, click here and capture a lecture. Uh, I've probably made it more complicated than it really needs to be, but uh, again, it's not rocket science. Um, and now that I have the compressor, you know, I can take those project files over to my desktop, my MacBook, and do the compression there and upload to YouTube there. These are all the different cloud services that uh, my version of, of Explain Everything connects to. I've got it connected to my Evernote account, I'm not sure why, but it was there. Um, you know, Google Drive, Box, YouTube, Vimeo. Uh, I do not connect pretty much anything campus related to my Facebook account. I'll just keep that for personal stuff. I could tweet out that, yes, I've, you know, done whatever. Um, so there are a lot, of, a lot of options there. Down to the end here. What I want to do for this coming semester is uh, basically not do the lecture capture in lecture, but do the lecture capture in advance of lecture, put them up on my YouTube channel, maybe bring them into TED-Ed if I want to build some lessons around them for the students to go through um, when they're you know, accessing my lectures before class so that we can then 
you know, if I don't have to talk about how the Mars Global Surveyor um, uh, Mars Orbiter uh, laser altimeter works. They'll know how it works and they can come into the classroom and we can do a simulation with uh, ping pong balls and stopwatches and so forth where they're you know getting collecting data and, and doing it. Uh, so that's that's my goal but uh, class is starting in a week so uh, we'll have to see how that goes. And that's what I got. Um, like I say uh, I found this to be a very natural way to um, to do the presentations that I want to do, which is maybe half of the time in class, without you know being stuck necessarily behind a computer screen, opening up a PowerPoint presentation, you know, talking with it, uh, and and the ability to annotate and 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 capture um, has been a real game changer. I don't know. We're a little bit over time. But I'd be happy to do address any other questions you have. So, two dollars and ninety-eight cents. I'd be afraid I drop it though. I'm and I move around a lot when I'm teaching, so I can just see if I found yeah. the yeah. yeah, they have, well, and they have okay. uh, they have uh, cases that have straps on the back. Now so, that I need, yeah. really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now you. <laughs> I need like a yo-yo chain on mine, okay? <laughs> you, you, you can get a dongle and yeah. put it into the VGA guest and leave it on. <laughs> and and you, know, you can walk. I, I, last, last spring when I was tethered, it had to stay there. If I wanted to walk over to the screen, which I do, right. you know, as, long as, I'm, as long as I'm just kind of back here, it's still going to be picking up uh, what I'm saying. So if you're more comfortable with it on the instructor podium, then you don't even have to worry about, you know, can I get my campus to figure out how to project wirelessly with an Apple TV or Air Server or, you know, some other unit. Great. Thanks.